Hello and welcome to Tools in the Shed, a podcast powered by Cars Guide, ready to rip into car stuff that has caught our eye this week. I'm Cars Guide Deputy Editor James, and with me is Senior Journalist Richard. Hello. And Staff Journalist Tom. Hello. This week, we're looking at the utes we want in Australia. We invented the things, after all. Uh, we'll discuss a trio of recent entries to the Cars Guide garage, and we'll catch up with a wild and crazy Art Deco lover in this week's Musk Watch. Um, YouTubers, you can jump ahead courtesy of the time codes in the notes below, and you can click on the chapter markers in the timeline. So let's go. Um, and first of all, it's yet another Byron story that has created a lot of buzz during the week. Um, it's a news bit about basically the utes that we want that would be perfect replacements for Holden Ute, Falcon Ute. Uh, we invented the thing, um, you know, Byron makes the case. In, in fact, I think it was, he, he talks about the, the person who was a farmer um, who wanted a vehicle that they could go to church in on Sunday, but carry pigs in on Monday. And uh, they petitioned Ford to make such a vehicle. And that person I, I recall was in Gippsland in Victoria. Um, but there are several utes out there that are, for whatever reason, denied us. And Byron has taken umbrage with that and put them up there and said, look, these are the ones we need. Please let them have us, have it, uh, right-hand drive, blah, blah, blah. We need them. And the, the first one, it's probably one of the longest gestation periods uh, of any vehicle in recent memory. And when we were talking about cars that just should come here, um, a few people in the comments called out that we'd overlooked the Hyundai Santa Cruz. And it's the first one. It's a cool looking little ute based on the Tucson. What do you guys reckon? Do you think it would be a success here? We've had the kind of hand, talk to the hand. Um, it's not going to be in right hand drive. To me, it would be a successful vehicle. What do you guys think? No, no, no way. Look, I love, I love Byron. If I wasn't married, I'd propose to Byron. I think he's, you know, amazing. Gotcha. And he's right. definitely got his finger on the pulse, but not this time. Okay. The, the, the unibody uh, utility has, has had done its job in Australia. Right. And we're, we're on to our, our Hiluxes and Rangers. We can't go back. Yeah. Right. Once, you go, once it... you go Ranger, you can't go back. But is it... It's not a binary thing, is it? It's not, you know, either or. There can be room for both, can there not? I mean, um, there have been utes like that around for some time. I reckon there'd be an appetite for, yeah. for a little lighter, lifestyle-y kind of thing. I look towards the end of it. I think those Falcon utes and Commodore utes became basically the Aussie two-door coupe. Um, you know, yeah. there was no <laughs> other coupe apart from a Monaro. Um, yeah. And I think that's what they're purpose was i think tradies migrated towards hiluxes and and d maxes and tritons and stuff like that mm -hmm. um realizing mm -hmm. that the um the, the car-based utes had limitations when it came to getting onto building sites and that type of thing but also right. as recreational right, right. vehicles too when they doubled as these off-road recreational videos party the party recreational the off-road recreational videos <laughs> the vehicles <laughs> Party yes. on the weekend, business and the, during the week type. And, and of video stuff. everything, yes. Video everything, video, video, video. Um, yeah, no, look, I think, look, the Santa Cruz, it would be as successful as the Suzuki Mighty Boy in Australia. And if you don't know what that is, it, you Tom, should. Tom, a counterpoint, or are you on the same page? I think, I think there's room for like one or two here but they're not set for the same sales success as like a dual cab pickup, right? Like right. people aren't going to be rushing to dealers to sell out the Santa Cruz. I mean, maybe initially it might have some of that, you know, uh, oh, it's like the newest, greatest thing rush. Novelty. You know, uh, yeah. Novelty. Yeah. Like having uh, like a Suzuki Jimny or something, you know, uh, and, and initially it gets a wait list of six months and everyone's really excited and then it just sort of falls to the wayside and becomes this thing. And it, it is like a hilarious ir irony that, you know, uh, I guess, you know, we, we could say we invented the thing and uh, the way global markets and logistics work, we just can't have any of them. Mm. Yeah, yeah, that's <laughs> because, right. Uh, the biggest consumers of these things are in the Americas, like these monocoque pickups. So um, I, I really like the look of the Santa Cruz, though. I think it's really cool how it's like, you know, a Tucson at the front and party at yeah. the back, as Richard yeah, said. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And it's, it's a mullet. You know, it is an automotive mullet. <laughs> it is an automotive mullet, yeah. And yeah. I, I, I like, 
how cool it is that it is actually like a dual cab as well. Like you can imagine it would be quite an accomplished passenger car as well as something yeah. on a tray. Yeah. Um, but I think, you know, ultimately consumers in Australia will turn on these things like that, you know, you might get an initial surge, but uh, yeah. uh, that, that interesting. It, it will, they don't want to be laughed be... at at the campground, right? Like, no, wow. Wow. Doing that? seriously. Laughed out at the campground. Mm. If, yeah, exactly. If you parked that Hyundai Santa Cruz in my street, someone would graffiti it or tip it over. Like that's, that's asking for it. That says more about your low car, though, Richard, than, <laughs> than the vehicle. It does. It does. I've only just taken the bars off our windows. But, um, yeah. That's right. <laughs> well, I, I wonder, further to your point, Richard, whether, you know, it's a really good point that you make about the transition from traditional utes to more ladder frame chassis based, you know, dual cabs. Yep. Um, to me, that was also the demise of the panel van. The panel yes. van uh-huh. went the way of the dinosaur some time ago, Absolutely. and that was probably part of that transition as well. It was a it was a lifestyle vehicle there for a while. You know, if it's rocking, don't bother knocking. Uh, I, I think your um, panel Absolutely. van has become your you know ARB canopy, hasn't it? <laughs> like yes, oh, it well it has. On the yeah, 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 exactly. Yes, your plumbers and you know your sparkies and whatever are actually using those to practical uh, purpose. So all well, right, fantastic. Raises a point, JC. I mean, what cars these days can you put a mattress in the back of? Well, mm. I you mean, could, you could get a very small mattress in your Santa Cruz and then put a canopy over that, but you would have true. to sleep in the fetal position or that's, something like that. That's true. Yeah. I mean, I suppose a high ace, like a 1999 high ace, is the high way ace. to go if you want, you know, a, right. a mattress in the back, of, you know, a bed car. Would you do I a mural you, as well? Would you do the Nordic kind of oh, uh, yeah. mural also? You'd do a Nordic space mural with Mash you know, Yes, yeah. definitely. I mean, on a, high like a lot of SUVs, you can probably, like bigger SUVs, you can probably do it in, provided the seats fold flat, because as we yes. know, that second row sometimes has Ooh. a better angle. Would, on it. would you then engineer, you'd take the window, the rear window out, engineer a heart shaped kind of divider yes. between the cabin and yes. the back of the, the vehicle? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Hey, and, Hyundai Palisade. That's that'd, right. be, that'd be and fantastic. a Flicardi kind of rug and Ooh, flat. Yeah. yeah, okay, yeah, the whole bit. Yeah. Okay, like well, that's a that's carpet. a potential area for Toyota to exploit with Definitely. the highlights. That's <laughs> Definitely. So really, we should be, Toyota is missing a trick here. There's a massive opportunity in the market to recapture that 70s glory um, of, of the panel fan. But we have roundly uh, panned the Santa Cruz then. It's not a contender really for the Australian market. But... We should move on to the next one on Byron's list, which is a car that hasn't even arrived in the States yet. It's the Ford Maverick. But Ford's on a bit of a roll when you think about uh, the Bronco Sport, uh, the Bronco, the upcoming Maverick. There's a lot of cool product coming into into that space for Ford in the US. Uh, Richard, do you think that car would be tipped over and set on fire on your street or would it have more of a chance? Look, maybe not the Ford Maverick. It um, if people could have a look at it, it does. It looks like a pretty tough little pickup. Um, I'm actually, you know, I'm kind of devastated that we're not getting the Bronco as well, which the Maverick is uh, closely related to. Um, they're both based on the the C2 architecture of the Focus. I think they would drive really well. I think that'd be a really nice finished car. Um, but I think um, when we spoke to Ford about whether it was coming to Australia, they used coded language which is not unlike PR people at all, but they said their words were, um, we're not sure whether it would measure up to Australian expectations. And right. by that, I think we took literally, it might not be big enough for Australia. Yes. And I think that's that's the case. It's probably just a bit too small. Was there the same kind of corny emphasis on the word measure when they were speaking to you? Did they make it that plain? We don't think it will... <laughs> measure up that i think they might have been talking about me actually in general <laughs> maybe nothing to do with the maverick <laughs> what about the ford tom would you would do you think do you see it as a bit a different prospect i love the look of it how cool is it it, mm. it it's like you know that you're right they are on a roll you know you've got bronco coming out that looks awesome this looks awesome and it doesn't matter which version of the bronco you have either the um, yep. little ranger based one or the even little uh focus based one c2 architecture it's Great, yeah. but it's also a worry. And I think in America, it's going to have petrol only drivetrains. And I think that's one of the problems here. Like, do Ford even have a diesel they can put in this? If, if they, I mean, there's right. so many logistical issues. Like, right. you have to find a good diesel, you have to put it in it, and then you have to make it in right hand drive. And also, if it's got, 
you know, a limited payload, limited towing capacity. I think those are the big concerns because those seem to be the big tick box items that manufacturers are looking for when it comes mm. to pickup trucks in our market. But that's, that's the thing, isn't it? Does it have to be diesel? Because presumably Ford is pitching it to this more lifestyle market, a 1.5, two litre petrol. Um, that might suit people who want to put stuff in the back to go to the beach as opposed to tools to go to the work site. You know, it's, it's that kind of car. Is, it, does it, would it need a diesel? No, I don't think it needs a diesel, especially for something this size. And with a limited towing capacity, I don't think you're going to be pulling something 3.5 tonnes in, in this. No. Um, and I, don't, I think it's going to be pretty good on fuel economy as well because they'd probably put something like a, you know, a dual clutch in there as well to, to save fuel. Um, yeah, look, I don't think it's a worry. I think a diesel would make it easier to drive for a lot of people as well, lifestyle-orientated buyers. Um, yeah. Yeah, and as well, you know, we all know that diesel is on the way out, um, and especially with emissions rules that are coming in very soon. I think diesel is going to be dead soon, not in America and Australia anytime soon, but definitely the rest of the world. Well, Byron is suggesting that uh, people should be picketing uh, or petitioning their local Ford dealer. Um, do you think it's worth that kind of activity? Is there something we could organise along those lines? I, I think, you know, don't, don't get me wrong. Like this, it'd be cool to have it for sure. It looks good. But, um, you know, speaking of being laughed out of the campground, like a 1.5 litre petrol turbo and a dual clutch. Really? No, no, you've got to own it. You've just got to drive in yeah. in your Maverick and own the place. Yeah. Uh, yeah. That's why they gave it a tough name. Maverick. Yeah. Maverick. 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 Yeah. Maverick is supersonic. Be there in 20 seconds or whatever it is. <laughs> okay. Um, so then this third one is one that has been bounced around a lot because it's been in the US market for some time. An unlikely uh, contender, when you think of Honda and you think of Utes, it's not a natural connection in my mind, but the Honda Ridgeline has been around in the US market for ages. Um, in fact, Byron calls out the fun fact that it was the 2017 North American car of the year. Um, so it's it's got a strong following. Now, if you want to talk engines, it's a 3.5 litre V6. Now, that's a petrol thing, nine-speed auto, torque converter. That's probably a little more serious in terms of it would have appeal for your lifestylers as well as your workers. What about that one? I reckon it's a goer, like, and it's and mainly because I think you just go to the United States and you see how big Honda is when it comes to Yeah, it's to that's a great it's point. like, holy it's a great crap. Point. Like, yeah. why don't they bring these here? Mm. Um I think it would be a pretty good move for Honda at the moment. Um, they can't, they've got nothing to lose. Um, I'm a little bit, mm. I'm, if Honda was your mate, you'd be a little bit worried in paying them a visit and just seeing if, you, you know, it's very much an are you okay day type of case with Honda. Right. I, 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 I'm, I'm worried about what's going to happen to them. Um, and I think a, <laughs> they may as well try everything. They bring that you to Australia. They, you never know. It could work. You'd be, looking, you'd be looking in the recycling for what kind of bottles are in there as to... <laughs> <laughs> the behaviour of your mate. But little, yeah. that's, that's, that's a great point you make, Richard, in that it only takes a visit. Well, put it this way, head into California, mm. Hondas are everywhere. Honda, yes. It's a big brand in the it States. Is. So the Ridgeline certainly makes a little more sense in that context. What are your thoughts, Tom? Yeah, three, three and a half litre V6, that's more realistic for our market. I think people will be into that. Um, and, you know, this is like a, a established, successful pickup truck in America. It's, you know, noted that it has the chops to do what people want it to do. Maybe not as much as, you know, your Ram 1500s and your ones that are maybe more equivalent to a dual cab in our market. Yeah. But that having been said, I think it would stand a pretty real chance in Australia. Um, but, you know, Honda, yeah. it's in a bad place, isn't it? It's, yeah. it, it's like business reorganization. I think some uh, globally strategic... Yep. Uh, misfortune befell it when it comes to our market because, you know, there was the whole thing from sourcing cars from Thailand, which mm. sort of has now backfired because we need yep. higher safety and it's just not set up to source cars from Japan. And its success in America largely hinges on the fact that it can build cars there. And, yep. you know, we know Subaru is in the same boat with this and they admitted that they would sell heaps of Subaru assets here if they could build it in right-hand drive, which they can't afford to. So, you know, yep. 
Yeah, it's a, it's a tough one. Uh, I think actually of this list here, it's the one we're the least likely to get, even though it probably yeah. stands the best chance. <clears throat> it would be the most appropriate. Yeah. For selling. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. No, it's interesting. Well, I think uh, I can speak for all of us. We've left the best till last. And <laughs> Byron has pulled one out of the hat here, the Fiat Strata. Now, the, the Fiat Strata ute, he says... Um, don't expect it to wash up on our shores anytime soon. It's a Brazil special. Um, it's been in that market for some time, and it's just under 4.5 metres long, so it's a metre shorter uh, than a Hilux. But I've got to say, if this thing came to our market, it is by far the most likely choice I would ever make for the Fiat brand. It's amazing. It looks incredible what do you guys think of the Fiat strata i don't know tom like honestly i would i would have any of the other three than than the Fiat strata i just i just i'm not sure of it all i'm not sure of the design its functionality and i'm not particularly convinced about its capability either yeah tom what do you reckon i love it i think it's so cool uh, uh, it's uh, this, Speaking of brands that have nothing to lose, Fiat, <laughs> right? Yeah. It, they have no other products. Like what happens when they stop building the petrol 500? This is the yeah. ultimate replacement. It's like your 500 for the Ute era. Like, yeah. It's well, cool. It's got a bit of ride height. You're right. It's going to be ho- like hopelessly capable compared to an actual pickup truck. But as you say, it's a, it's a full meter smaller than a Hilux. This is the Fiat 500. Of pickup trucks, I love it. But then my, so my mind That's goes not a to good the, selling point, Tom. <laughs> my mind's back in the campground, and if you're worried about your campground cred, <laughs> pulling in in the Fiat Strata—that's a struggle. Wow. Um, you've got to have a healthy ego to be able to do that. But I never thought I, I just did, could not contemplate anybody in this market or anywhere else buying a Fiat Fremont. You know what? What is the? But they did. They did. People bought a Fiat Fremont. It's a Dodge Journey, but it's just got Fiat badges slapped on it. It's the most uh, obvious case of badge engineering you could ever find. So there, there would be an appetite, I'd reckon, for the Maybe, Fiat Strata. I just don't think that a buyer for a ute would want something that looks that lame. Um. <laughs> <laughs> but, but as we were saying, like, at the beginning, right, with the um, uh, the, Hyund- the Hyundai one, uh, the Santa Cruz, yeah. Yeah. Um, this isn't for a ute buyer necessarily. I think this is kind of your it's – it's a really niche product. Um, but Fiat's a niche brand, and I think it would kind of, kind of suit them, you know, in our yeah. market anyway. Like, don't, they don't need to sell many; they need to sell enough to justify having the Fiat brand in Australia. And I don't think any product in their catalog stands as good a chance. <laughs> <laughs> Couldn't you imagine? You know, if your your all Fiat garage was a Fremont, a five hundred, and a Serrata, <laughs> you'd be catching the bus. <laughs> you certainly wouldn't be going camping. Well, I think the, those do, those rebranded Fiat Dodge products were oh, incredible. Mistake. Anyway, people bought them. Um, so let's hear what people out there have to say. Uh, let us know if you're a YouTuber in the comments. Uh, email us at uh, comments at carsguide.com.au. Get in on the conversation. Let us know what you think. <laughs> But for now, we are going to move to our garage and cars that we have been driving in the recent past. And it's emphasis on the cars, plural, Richard, because yes. you're, going to, you're going to touch on a story that you've been at the centre of. Please fill us in. Oh, yes. I've, I've had three cars in my garage um, and they, they've been biggies, biggies. Um, right. Uh, look, myself and uh, Nadal, um, our family reviewer, put together a comparison video where we compared a um, eight-seater Hyundai Palisade with an eight-seater Kia Carnival with an eight-seater Mercedes-Benz Valente. And the, idea be- the idea behind this was, okay, so if, if, if you've got three children or more and you're looking for a vehicle, what do you go? Do you, do, you, do, you, do you go for an SUV, a big SUV? Do you go for a people mover van? Yeah. Or do you just admit that, your life's over and you yeah. go for a bus. Um, yeah, or do you move a few of your kids on for scientific <laughs> yeah. experiments, as yeah. Monty Python would have you do? Yeah, exactly right. So what we do is we put these three really, really different vehicles to the test and we test them for, you know, what they like to drive, but mainly in terms of, you know, 
how much stuff you can get in. And we yeah. we only one of these vehicles was able to fit in our our our, our mega test bunch of kids gear, which we which we put into the the, the boot behind the third row. Just one of them um, might not be the one you think. Um, all really nice cars to drive. Um, apart from the Valente, it's it's based on a commercial Ute. Uh, sorry, commercial van, not a yeah. Ute. I've got Utes yeah, in the yeah. brain. Um, yeah. So it's a little bit more rough and ready, um, but there is something about that van which I really, really like. And if you are moving people, just yeah. people without all their without all their gear, um, you know, executives and stuff like that, the van actually is a really way good way to go. So you're right. bringing executives up from the airport. Um, but if you want comfort, um, we 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 discovered that it was probably going to be one of the other two. I'm not going to give too much away, but diesel Palisade, petrol Carnival, and a diesel Valente. Um, and yeah. it was a fun test, and it's coming out soon, coming out next week. It's it's such a great premise because I suppose one of the things we have to be watchful uh, on is not being too um, rigid in terms of how we line up vehicles because. Consumers don't do these things in what might be a logical way. Okay, here are all these SUVs. They're priced similar point, roughly the same size. People are thinking about all kinds of things. Are we yeah. going to buy a car or are we going to have yeah. a holiday? Or maybe yeah. we'll buy a boat. And yeah. then when it comes to actually when they do decide to buy a car, they're just thinking about that need uh, for eight seats as yeah. opposed to you know particular categories of car. It's a really good premise. It's a lot of money as well. When you've got three kids, it's very difficult to try and find something that's going to fit them all that's new under like 70 grand. The, the Palisade was yeah. 75,000. The Carnival was 65 and so was the Valento. Okay. Um, so it's quite a lot of money. And look, people that do have three kids, uh, they, you know, they, they feel the pain because a Santa Fe really isn't going to cut it in terms of trying to get two in there and then you've got a, you know, a, a back row, which is, sort of sometimes only seats. So you really yes. need something that fits eight or seven properly, um, especially if you've got little kids. So, yeah, um, yeah, it was a good test to do. I mean, we enjoyed it. So it's coming out soon. Because the extra seats could be kids' friends or yes. extended family, like it might be um, yeah, yeah, others, it's the grandparents yep. or whoever. Yep. Um, yeah, so you're right. People with um, six kids, it's not that common. <laughs> It's really about the occasional yeah. seating, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah that's yeah. right. That's right. Very so good. the results are interesting because, yeah, the boat, all of them drove completely differently. Yeah. Um, and we were surprised by the boot in the Palisade for, um, you know, all the wrong reasons. For various reasons. Yeah, yeah. Okay. <laughs> all right. Well, uh, Tom, on to you. Thank you, Richard. Um, we've been talking about utes at the top of the show. You're going to talk about a different one, but it is quite different. Fill us in, please. Yeah, so I was at the launch this week, and this is actually the first day I can talk about it, which is exciting, of the uh, Amarok W580. And so yep. this is a, a new Amarok variant that has been tuned up by a famous local tuning outfit, Walkinshaw, um, who many will remember from Holden fame, um, worked on many Holdens. And uh, basically the concept behind this was, you know, Volkswagen, uh, like we're one of the, we're one of the um, biggest markets in the world. I think we're the second biggest in market in the world for Amarok, but um, wow. as yeah, far as Volkswagen's concerned, we're the most important in a lot of ways. Um, so that car gets a, like a bigger voice at the international table from our perspective than most Volkswagens. And uh, they sort of get a little bit of leeway to do stuff like this, which is kind of cool with it. Um, now it looks like a special edition. And when I was looking at the pictures, I was like, oh, okay, it's got a few stickers and like, what have they actually done to it? Right. And it has no more. And, you know, to be clear from the outset, no more power. They haven't touched the engine. Um, it has the same 190 kilowatt, 500 and, 580 newton meter engine as the ultimate 580 um mm -hmm. but it is worth noting that you probably don't need to play with that because that engine also appears in like the sq7 and like you know porsche because uh -huh. I, I thought 580 was cubic inches i thought it was some kind of you know crate People. engine they just yeah. dropped in there yeah um and so what walk have actually done to it, it like it, it is much cooler to look at in the metal than it is in the pictures because it's much more than just a set of wheels and stickers um what they've actually done to it is they've retune the suspension on both axles they've raised it at the front by 40 millimeters and that sounds counterintuitive because part of the objective with this truck was to make it 
better on-road. They didn't want to lean into the whole off-road thing, like, you know, Master BT-50 Thunder and Ranger Raptor and this kind of thing. They wanted to do something different. And uh, they've actually raised it at the front by 40 millimeters. And so we, I asked them, I said, you know, why not, why not slam it? Like, make it low, make it like, like go low luck spec, you know? And they said, well, one of the other things about this project is neither of them wanted to harm the ability of the car. So they wanted to maintain the towing capacity. They wanted to maintain the payload. So um, there were limitations on what they could do with the rear suspension. So to make, to make it more balanced, they simply lifted it at the front instead of lower okay. the whole thing. And that right. way it maintains all of its ability. It even maintains its off-road ability, even though it's road focused. Um, and it's more balanced across both axles. The suspension tune is pretty magical um it's yeah. much firmer than something like a ranger raptor like ra the ranger raptor is really good at filtering the road filtering bumps like even on unsealed stuff it's amazing this is more connected and it is a really different product and uh the grip levels are quite absurd in it like you can throw it's a massive dual cab you you can throw it into quarters at all because that's what i was going to ask tom if if part of the ambition is to retain the off-road capability what are the tires are they a a kind of crossover or more focused for on-road or what kind of rubber does it run on? They're Pirelli all-terrains. They're Scorpion all-terrains. And, <laughs> um, and it's on a 20-inch forged alloy. And so the wheel, and they're one inch wider than the tire and wheel combination on the Ultimate. So, okay. And you see them in the flesh and they're quite wide. Um, and that gives it kind of that grip level, even though they're, they're like all-terrains on the tarmac. Um, but the interesting thing is because they're, they're forged alloys and they actually use the same supplier as they use for like, uh, the GTSR and stuff like that, uh, from Taiwan, wow. um, the whole wheel and tire package weighs the same as a standard ultimate 580 wheel, Great. even though the tires are heavier and the wheels are much bigger. So, um, yeah, that, that was a cool little tidbit that they've put in there. But other than that, it's like the same, uh, Amarok, uh, fair, that engine is awesome. So, you know, you can understand why they didn't play with it. And I think I was talking to the Volkswagen guys and they said, look, we could have done, we could have done an ECU flash to give it like SQ seven levels of power and stuff like that. Um, but I think the, the problem with that was, uh, you know, you've got warranty implications and stuff like that. Right, and right. You know, to get the approval for that was another hurdle again. And I just there'd, well. there'd always be an economy penalty as well, I imagine. And yeah. also you've also got to leave room to uh, go up higher uh, for grades down the track, I'd say. Maybe. Yeah, well, uh, and that was the other thing. It was uh, interesting to chat to them at the event because they were very keen on uh, alluding to the fact that there may be an alternate version of this truck being built with Walkinshaw that will be more off-road focused. Yeah. Okay, little, great. little newser about it, um, but they, they're keen to do more. Um, and so we might see something like that early next year. Who knows? So, you know, if you're looking for a more off-road focused Amarok, things to come. Very interesting. Very interesting. Okay, I will round things off. And I've been driving this week the BMW M3 competition. So uh, that's the three-litre twin turbo, inline six, of course. It's 375 kilowatts, um, which I, I think is around 500 horsepower. It's 650 newton metres, um, and that starts at 2650 RPM. Eight-speed Steptronic Auto, so it's a torque converter auto, um, mm. rear-wheel drive, and it's just over 150K, 154, 900. So it competes with, you know, your Audi RS4, which is just under 150, Merck AMG C63S sedan. It's a bit pricier, 168, 300, but they're all in that same ballpark. So the German big three have all got offerings um, in this part of the market. Zero to 100 kmh in 3.5 seconds. That's a fast four-door. Um, this car particularly, as people on YouTube will be able to see, uh, the colour is called Isle of Man Green Metallic. Jeez. And if I had a dollar for every time someone asked me, oh, what's that colour? It is an amazing colour. It looks incredible. Um, the fact is it was mixed with a Kailami orange trim, which was just a bit much for my taste, uh, a very strong combination. Um, but you've got things like Active Diff, the seats are amazing. Um, and actually, one of the little things, irrespective of their, their kind of grippiness, which they are, is they're able to be heated and ventilated, cooled at the same time. So you could have, I, I for example, was in the rain yesterday and a little bit damp. You got in, I had one, one out of three of heat 
and two were ventilation. It was just perfect. It kind of helped you um, get back to a normal state. Really like that. 2M settings that you can set up. Fine tuning the setup is actually a lot of fun and it's great. The, the granular level you can go down to now um, is quite something. And it's practical. It's a four-door. It fitted all of our um, luggage, our three-piece luggage set into the boot. And it will easily fit things like a kid's stroller and, and all of that. It's a three-door sedan, a three um, four-door sedan. Uh, so you get all of that practicality. Um, it is properly fast, very, very capable dynamically. Um, there were a couple of things I didn't like. It has wireless CarPlay, which is great, but it's a pretty shitty connection. It just yeah. was, all, you know, spitting at you and not connecting all the time, which I found uh, frustrating. And there is a fake exhaust sound, like there's some synthetic support of the engine exhaust, which I'm not a fan of. It just feels like you're being lied to. Um, you can turn it off, uh, but I don't I don't like that. But it was heaps of fun to drive. That um I remember the launch of that car a few years ago when the first generation or the next generation came out of the M3 and M4. We were mm -hmm. talking to one of the engineers about that that synthetic sound. Yeah. And um he was going into a lot of detail about how they had used an algorithm to get the sound exactly exactly the same as the exhaust note of the car and <laughs> <laughs> yeah just do it properly and then it's piped through the speakers uh -huh. and i'm like but hang on so you've used an algorithm to get the sound of the, the car but the car sounds like that he goes yeah but the problem we've got is that the insulation of the car is so good people can't yeah. hear it yeah the inside well, well um, when it when it's at its most um aggressive it's too loud mm. and it's instantly obvious that it's synthetic it's yeah. just a real yeah. letdown i don't like it i think in terms of um m3 m4 though i love the practicality and also i mean it's not a sleeper car by any stretch of the imagination but i do love the fact that it's got two back doors and mm -hmm. and you know the m4 it's a beautiful car as well but i kind of like that that you know fast sedan you know c63 um m3 you know yep RS4. Well, it'd be interesting too, the, the elephant in the room, or rather the big teeth in the room is the grill. And, mm. you know, people are seemingly polarised on that. Um, last week, and the, in this car, it's black. It's blacked out, um, which yes. is a different, different look altogether. Um, last week, we were split. I was in the minority in terms of not liking that grill. Where do you guys sit on that um, three and four series uh, grill? Oh, I'm not a fan. It's too right. big. Like, it's, right. you know... But look, you know, BMW's grills have sort of grown and shrunk over the years. Yeah, two double O two grill is quite tall, um, and you know they've they've all, they've all changed. But all grills have become bigger. You know, yeah. um, you just look yeah. at you know a Hyundai Palisades grill or you know a Genesis grill or something like that. Everything's got bigger, including BMW. I think it's too. I think it's too over the top, though. Tom, Tom apparently you can buy kits to modify the grill. <laughs> Um, what, just what like you, the uh, Discovery tailgate. That's right. <laughs> yes. You can buy a symmetrical tailgate. Yeah. yeah. To fix what, do you, what do you think? Where, where do you sit on that discussion? Uh, I'm really going to reserve my judgment until I see this car in the metal and can spend a little bit of time looking at it. I've seen, mm. the, I've seen a handful on the road already, mm. um, but it is controversial, I understand. And my first sort of view of it from the pictures is I don't like it. Um, but that having been said, I, I am very conscious that, you know, especially doing this job, that when you see something in the metal, it can have quite a different effect. Right. So I'm going to wait and reserve my judgment until I've spent a little bit of time up close with one so I can perfect decide. Happily, we have one member of the team that's more mature than Richard and I and is able to actually <laughs> I know, I know. You're so execute a professional stuff. approach. You'd never, you'd never know you had a, a background as a lawyer. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. All right. Well, that's good. Um, that's our garage. And we'll move on to feedback from last week, which was about the GR Corolla, which isn't that far down the track. There are a few surprises um, that we'd uncovered in terms of more power than the GR Yaris and, and other bits and pieces. And Jim's Garage Toys said, I was so upset when Toyota didn't bring the GR Yaris to the States, but now I'm even more excited for the GR Corolla to arrive. I would pre-order one now if I could. 
So um, it's obviously the case that that GR Yaris isn't going to the States, but the Corolla is. So mm -hmm. Jim's Garage Toys is pretty happy about it. Um, Thomas Wills says, I wonder how much more power that little three-cylinder can put out. And I reckon that's a fair question. <laughs> uh, I think in the end, that's going to be the real question. Once tuners start tuning it, will it be close to its limits or will it be able to put out another 200 horsepower? <laughs> um, and that's a fair question. And it's one that we talked about when, uh, when we were discussing the car. How far can you push a one-litre triple? But there'll be a few legs out of bed, I, I think, if you, if you push it too far. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's the thing. If you, in an engine, if you're increasing the power, you've just got to increase its strength. And if you can't increase its, compa its capacity, it's more air, more, I, you know, more air, more fuel. More force. And, yeah. and, and, and can it just take the stress and strain? It's, um, it's a fair question. Well, it's there's only one way to find out. <laughs> That's right. Let's blow a few up. I agree. It's a bit of a catch, isn't it? Because, you know, like the, obviously that engine is awesome in the, in the GR Yaris. It is. Then, and it would be great in a GR Corolla in its current state. But I mean, that's the question, isn't it? It's like, how much further can you go? You know, when you've got people were raising eyebrows at things like the AMG A45, it's like, yeah. how much further can that engine go? And this Toyota one has three cylinders. Like, that's right. Uh, it's just why, the evolution why? of technology, isn't it? It's, it's what's possible. And you just have to recalibrate your mind um, as, as you go further along. And Toyota have built a car or two, they kind of know <laughs> what they're doing. And I suppose we'll wait and see, but it's exciting. It's, super it's nice to see them though. Be, it's nice to see them not be so conservative. Is yeah, it, like, true, true. They, but they like, I think, so long. I think with Toyota though, you never see them go too nuts. Um, yeah, they they yeah. know they definitely know you know how far to go. They never step over the line. Um, hmm. But there are lots of people who will, and they'll take that that car and they'll push it as far as it. Goes. Oh, the aftermarket could could oh, be a problem. Oh that's yeah. Exciting. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> for all the wrong reasons. Yeah. But one of the little uh, nuggets that was turned up in that story was that the GR Corolla's eventual wagon sibling um, could be motivated by a self-charging hybrid powertrain with a two-litre engine. So that got a few people's attention. And Adam B said a wagon version of the GR Corolla would be awesome, but wishful thinking, I imagine, at which point our old mate Peter Panousis uh, was one of several yeah. to reply uh, the double P came in and said, a Corolla GR all-wheel drive wagon would top my extensive shopping list. Now, for any regular listeners and viewers of the podcast, Peter yes. Panusa's shop lifts, shopping list oh. is extensive and it stretches back years. He's Bread, been milk, in yogurt. shopping a car. Which yep. car am I going to buy? He right. says he's a, he's a fan of the Golf R wagon, but its exorbitant price rules it out. A pocket rocket in wagon form from a re reputable, relatively speaking, his words, not mine, uh, manufacturer is attractive AF. Um, so that's what Peter thinks. A wagon, a hot wagon. I reckon well, we, we, Golf R wagon has always been a, a cheeky favourite of mine. What a, what a great car. Oh, it's the same it. thing, isn't it? It's like the it's like the monocoque pickup truck. Uh, it's a niche product, but for yeah. those who are into it, they're into it, you know. Um, yeah. I, I love this idea because Corolla has a strong lineage of wagon variants that we haven't seen in Australia for a while. Mm. I don't know if anyone else has noticed, but it seems like the uh, Corolla Fielder hybrid station wagon from Japan has recently had its import approval. So there's a whole heap of them rolling around at the moment. I love seeing them. Tom, a amazing, movie. amazing that you should mention that. <laughs> I love that you know that. CIM crew, CIM crew says there is a Corolla hybrid wagon. It's called the Fielder. Uh, and he recently spotted one in Sydney. So there you go. And uh, for people watching on YouTube, we'll have a picture of the current model. It uses the older Prius um, 1.5 powertrain. If you wanted a Toyota Wagon Turbo, there's a Toyota Caldina. Um, mm -hmm. They were everywhere last time I went to New Zealand. Now, it's the sports wagon, third gen finished in 2007. So it's an older car now. But there was a GT4 version. Mm. And it had the 3S GTE engine in it, 191 kilowatts, 324 newton meters. Awesome. So yeah, cool. um, oh, the cow there you go. And so, yeah, um, yeah, it must be one of their number one imports to New Zealand because they are everywhere. Everywhere. <laughs> cool. Yeah, another thing to admire the Kiwis for. Okay. Um, Jim Danik says, I wanted to buy a secondhand Toyota Celica for my first car in the early 80s, but couldn't afford the $4,500 price tag. Okay. <laughs> Also remember Peter Williamson's Celica at Bathurst in 1979 being the first car to carry a live camera. 
Toyota has a long history in making sports cars. We were talking about how yes. there's been this gap where Toyota went into white goods mode, but Corolla and other Toyota models, but Corolla particularly has a really long history of motorsport and sporty mm. models. Mm. Um, and I'm with you, Jim. I remember Peter Williamson. I always thought that Celica was one of the coolest cars on the grid in mm. Bathurst. And what a guy. Race cam and Peter Williamson just talking casually while he's ripping around uh, Mount Panorama. Huge memory for me as well. And, and that technology went to America. I think yeah. um, Channel 7 held various patents on it or, or yes. rights to it, and well, it been around the world after that. Australia pioneered yeah. that, that in-car camera technology. And yeah. we, we, it, it went, went into stump cam, yeah. or cricket. Whenever well, look, it's, a, it's up there with the, uh, the motor mower and the hills hoist, yes. I think, as yeah. a great, great Aussie yeah. export. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, tiny little cameras. Well, it wasn't so tiny to start. No, it wasn't. Actually, it was big. And it needed an yeah. Eiffel Tower's worth of engineering did to it, actually put it did in. Did it also car. require a cameraman to operate it? In a very back. small cameraman <laughs> in a very small seat at the back. See, not enough credit goes to that To that, that person. person. I, I agree. mean, to sit there in a helmet and a full yeah. race suit in a five-point harness oh. while filming. Little Ron, the no, seven network Ron. camera guy. Yeah. Oh, Little Ron. It's like that um, incredible Mercedes Benz <laughs> data collection car that they used uh, ah. for like collecting information, like various information on uh, yeah. like uh, Mercedes Benz mule models and connected by umbilical cords. Yeah, it was yes. before wireless. So it's connected awesome. by an umbilical cord. And half the car awesome. is this like rudimentary data what? collection equipment. And it had wicker seats in the What's this? But Tom, I've seen that car. And the thing is, it is finished to showroom standard in every aspect. And what yet car is this? all elements of it are custom. Like it is a one-off. I think the front clip is probably standard car, but everything else, but it's been finished as if you're going to go and buy it in the showroom. So hang on. It was, I feel like I've missed this episode. What, 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 what is this? <laughs> so pre, pre Bluetooth, pre Wi-Fi, pre yeah. wireless connection. Yeah. The way to capture data in real time from another car, um, Daimler Benz at that stage struck on the idea of having a vehicle following the one in front, but with long umbilical cords stretching back to it and a couple of boffins in the back actually processing the data. So they oh. made a, a lengthened car with a, a kind of acrylic canopy yeah. that, that allowed this to happen. Yeah, right. Why didn't they just sit in the car and hook up? Uh, it may have affected the data. Right. Okay. <laughs> So, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll dig out a picture of that for people on YouTube. Hopefully you'll be able to awesome. see that. Um, it is in the Mercedes-Benz Museum. If it you is. You can never travel again. Amazing. It, is. It, is. it is. It's awesome. And like I say, it's finished to the nth degree. Uh, now, Sergio Maron says, I live in the USA and Toyota doesn't offer a real enthusiast vehicle made solely by Toyota. I'm not interested in a Toyota made by BMW or Subaru. And then Cool James, great name. Cool James says, "Is that you, James? Is that?" Yeah. Well, no, it wasn't me, but I'll put him up to it. Uh, does it really matter? The GR Supra and eighty six, as well as the upcoming GR eighty six, are some properly awesome cars. Just because they're not one hundred percent Toyota doesn't necessarily mean it's bad. What do you guys think? It's all about your affinity to a brand and and knowing whether it's authentically part of that brand or it doesn't matter. Where do you sit on that one? Nothing's nothing's pure anymore i mean you know everybody's sharing everything else um yep. and even when it comes down to components everybody goes to the same place to source their same chips since it's bosch and everything it's like Leah, that. it's bosch, whatever yeah it's Borg warner it's tremac it's you know it's garrett so look it's you know i understand what he's saying you know the 86 is also a brz and the you know z4 is a you know a supra but um, if it wasn't for those connections, we wouldn't have those cars. Um, but I, yeah. I understand what he's saying. Um, but, you know, in reality, you've got to have these massive joint ventures in order to be able to survive, I think. Are you fussed by it, Tom? Yes and no. I 100% I agree with the sentiment. Um, that having been said, the Super is fantastic. Oh. It is just a BMW, but it's fantastic to drive. I agree. And I think like, I'm, it wouldn't. It wouldn't have existed otherwise. It does look amazing in the metal, you know, with yeah. that bodywork, and it is yeah. really different from either the eighty six or the Z four. So, yeah, you know, it's a unique product in its own way. But I, I do get the sentiment. It would be nice if it was fully a Toyota. 
Yeah, but I think I think Richard's point is a, a super valid one. They wouldn't exist unless yeah. there was that collaboration and and some rationalisation on costs and development. So yeah, cool. But good good discussion. Mm. Finally. Uh, look, I made the mistake of adding hashtag Dogecoin um, on our social media postings <laughs> last week. And we got lots of replies in the YouTube comments. Uh, one from Car Guide using our logo and multiple references to trading professionals, Mr. John Kennedy and Mr. Bruce Wayne and a US phone number. Needless to say, that's nothing to do with us <laughs> and stay away. So <laughs> we, had some, we had some crypto bots um, in the comments on YouTube. Which, in a way, is a badge of honour. I think that's uh, it's almost um, a turning point for us. But uh, anyway, nothing to do with us. But speaking of nothing to do with us, it's time for Musk Watch. Right. Okay. Let's get into it. This is the weekend that the deer leader actually hosts Saturday Night Live. Yep, you heard that right. So he's going to be one of the least charismatic people on the planet is going to host Saturday Night Live. And according to Futurism, it appears that some SNL cast members seem unhappy with Elon hosting, and they've been having a bit of a go, a bit of a go on social media. Um, there was a wide range of reactions, Futurism says, um, but some of the more interesting responses came from the cast members. And, you will you know, people that are familiar with SNL, it's generally Hollywood film stars, comedians, sports identities. Um, the last kind of non-person not fitting that description was Donald Trump some time ago. Um, so here we've got Elon. And Elon put out a tweet just saying, let's find out just how live Saturday Night Live really is. And Bowen, Bowen Yang, who's a cast member, said, what the fuck does that even mean? You know, he's just, and he's right. What does that mean? A.D. Bryant, who is another cast member, posted on Instagram a, a, a quote from Senator Bernie Sanders that criticised the fact that the 50 wealthiest people in America today own more wealth than the bottom half of the population. So 50 people have more wealth than 165 million people together do. So that was her future. And I know in our, our comments from last week's uh, episode, Jim Danik had um, praised a comment that Peter Anderson made. He said, billionaires are a policy failure. <laughs> and and um, Jim Danik just said, thank you, Peter Anderson, with a hand clapping <laughs> uh, which was pretty good. But then Chris Redd, another cast member, well, he also po poked fun at Musk's recent attempts at crowdsourcing some truly terrible sketch ideas um, Elon said, you know, throwing out some skit ideas for SNL, what should I do? And Chris Redd said, first, I'd call them sketches. So he's gone skit. Um, Elon said, these are, his, these are his ideas for bits on Saturday Night Live. Baby Shark and Shark Tank merge to form Baby Shark Tank. Oh, that's Elon's idea? That's Elon's idea. Of course um, it is. His other one was Irony Man defeats villains using the power of irony. <laughs> It's going to be fun. It's going to be hilarious. Um, he then, and then the story in Futurism said, unfortunately, we all know they won't take the actual good ideas, which was from lo-fi John Beats to study relax to, said, Make it, maybe a skit about that cave diver. <laughs> which was oh. <laughs> ghetto guy. Um, um, then he, he, he randomly tweeted, I love Art Deco. And various people thought, Okay, there's a Lana Del Rey album called Art Deco. Maybe he's yeah. referring to that. Also, he's been warming up for this Saturday Night Live show in 30 Rockefeller Plaza, which is a massive Art Deco building. So maybe he's just stood out front of and gone, I love Art Deco. Yeah. But Miss Alley Cat responded to him by saying, I love you. You can do anything you want to my body. Wow. And Mr. Sam, in response to Miss Alley Cat, said, you don't love him. You just love money. And I think <laughs> Mr. Sam's pretty right. Mr. Sam. Mr. Sam. Ma Martina Glusevic said, Elon, I made these princess donuts just for you. Hope you like them. And people on YouTube will be able to see the image. It's actually these little cakes with a Shiba Inu doge dog face in the cream filling, which is fantastic because wow. everyone's trying to get him to mention various cryptocurrencies so they can cash in yeah. on the inevitable surge 
that happens after he does. And Rob Fogwill said, UK Art Deco train, this loco has record for fastest steam loco in the world. And it's this train, I looked it up, it's called the Mallard. But um, SMM FLO said, this is giving off some serious Thomas the Tank Engine vibes. And when you look at it, it is blue and it does look a bit yeah. like Thomas the Tank Engine. I thought it was quite funny. Have you seen those weird drawings of Thomas the Tank Engine that's actually a man lying on his belly? Oh, I have. The tank with his I face have. That up. is quite unsettling. I have seen that. <laughs> well, um, well, there's yeah. another one that someone made where um, it, it's like a, it's a Thomas the Tank Engine toy and it's got his face and someone's made a mechanism where it opens up like a like the alien from alien and, a, and a grotesque mouth comes out oh wow i want that i want that actually think, to, share, to share with kids I, I i think i think elon needs to be really really careful i mean hosting saturday night live is like going into you know jabber's you know underground cave um, right. from Star So Wars. Jabba the Hutt. Jabba the Hutt. Like you do, are, do you think he'll end up like Leia in a leather bikini kind of I lying. think he will. I think he will. Yeah. He'll get thrown in that dungeon with that monster. Um, oh, yeah. I, look, I, I think he's got to be really careful. I think the only way to host Saturday Night Live if you're not a comedian is just completely straight. Straight. Just let everybody else be funny. Don't try and make don't try and crack the jokes. That's a great point. Is it, it's a it is a potential train wreck. This could be this could be the turning point where it could be the SNL point where when Fonzie tried to jump the shark on shark. water skis, this could be it. Um, mm, interesting. Uh, so I, uh, I, I, yeah, I, I think this could be the moment where it, it could be his downfall. Um, he shouldn't be funny. He should go in there. He should be completely straight. Yeah. Well, he Danger. he is a twelve year old, so the the humour that he does have is fairly juvenile. So uh, it'll be interesting to see how he goes mixing it with professional comics. I am enjoying all the tweets, though. I'm, I'm flicking through some now, and he's got one here. Throwing out some skit ideas for Saturday Night Live. What yeah. did I do? And yeah. one of the top replies is, pay your fair share of taxes. <laughs> so, I like that. That's right. That's right. <laughs> Sorry. I love the I love the randomness and um, the, the wit of some of those responses. Very, very, very good. Now, um, Speaking of uh, cryptos, um, the Tesla share price actually is down a bit. It's down about $23 at uh, 670 nearly 671 It was 694 last week. But Yahoo Finance um, says, and a very, uh, our Aussie um, finance guru, Peter Switzer, has said, beware Bitcoin and Tesla, um, warns top Aussie investor. One of Australia's greatest stock market players is worried about Bitcoin and stocks like Tesla and thinks they have dot-com bust written all over them. So, yeah. you know, some would say that's stating the bleeding obvious. But the guy in question is Hamish Douglas, co-founder of Magellan Financial Group, who's been a pretty good stock market performer since 2004. And he says going long Bitcoin and Tesla is speculation and their shares could blow up anytime soon. There's uh, one Tesla, every, every week, though, isn't there? There's I a, know. There's a, an investor, it's going to happen. And they always have names like Hamish and... Well, well, Hamish. Well, this person's Hamish. What a coincidence because <laughs> so, so many other Hamishes. Yeah. Uh, I've got to I've got to say, though, like we've talked about this, you know, on this show quite regularly, what what does happen when the reality catches up with yeah. Tesla shareholders? I'll tell you yeah. what happens. Every the society crumbles and we're, we we run for the hills and it's wow. every one for themselves. So it's yeah. the this well, SNL yeah. is the first domino. So the, 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 the tragedy domino. of SNL leads yeah. to a fall in the share price, leads to the the actual dissolution of well, society as we that's know. That's the exact yeah. thing, isn't it? One mm. errant comment on Saturday Night Live can yeah. have this huge effect yes. on yeah. Yeah, the share price yeah. of any one of these companies. And yeah. You know, what does happen, we can, you know, talk about cryptocurrencies all you want, but what does happen when the reality catches up that Tesla is a fraction of the size of a brand like Toyota, right? Mm. And the mm. capability of that brand to pump out cars is mm. minuscule in comparison. Well, you know? Tom, you've done it yet again, a beautiful segue, because the story says, you know, <laughs> t- uh, this person, uh, Hamish, our old mate Hamish says, yeah. Tesla is a great car company, but it is really more, is it really more valuable than Toyota, Volkswagen and General Motors? Mm. In January, Tesla was an $880 US stock, but by March it was $600. Now it's $762. That's the price movement of a very risky stock. So from share and share investor advisors, 
are, well, this is so volatile. It has been for a long time. It is like a powder keg ready to blow up. So no, SNL, could, SNL could be the detonator it, of, the, it, of the bomb that is the Tesla share price. It will be. It will be. Like this will go down Saturday Night Live, Elon's appearance will mark the downfall of him. And it's a shame. Of if you're humanity. Saying, yeah. Well, well, in turn, then humanity. Humanity. After that. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. All right. Well, that's a great note to end the show on. I think um, with that, we have reached the finish line. I want to say thank you, Tom. Thank you. And thank you, Richard. And sorry, thank you and sorry for everything else. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. Enjoy the time while you have it. And thanks to our head of schmoozing, employee experience designer, and podcast programmer, Mr. Pritchard, for his production wizardry. Today, he's wearing a T-shirt saying, I'd flex but I really like this shirt. Rick and Morty shorts and cat shoes. No, not heavy earth moving type footwear, cat shoes. Cat um, shoes. Let us know your thoughts. You can find Cars Guide on Facebook and Instagram or email us at comments at carsguide.com.au. If you're an Apple podcast listener, please rate and review us. Remember, you can also watch us on YouTube. And if you are already, Make sure you subscribe to the Cars Guide YouTube channel so you can stay on top of all our latest content. But before we go, you know, this is, uh, this is actually a big issue for me and um, I do need some support. So serious mm, replies okay. only, please. Um, I've suspected for some time that my wife has been having an affair. Oh, um, That's terrible. Usual signs, you know, yeah. phone rings, I answer, whoever's yeah. on the other end hangs up immediately. Um, oh, we've all been there. She started going out with the girls um, a lot recently, although every time I ask which girls, same answer, oh, just people from work, you don't know them. That's right. Um, I look out for her coming home late. She always walks in from a little further up the road. Yes. Uh, and although I can't see it, I can hear a car moving away. You know, is it an Uber? Um, is it friends dropping her off? Um, I once picked up her mobile just to see what time it was, and she went crazy, yes. said I should never touch her phone again, and why was I checking up on her? Oh, James. Um, anyway, look, I've never broached the subject. I don't, I, I don't think I want to know the truth, um, really. Just talk but to last me. night I'd had enough, and soon after she went out again, uh, I decided to check on her. I, I snuck out and hid behind my car, <gasps> which gave an unobstructed view of the whole street so I could see who picked her up. Um, it was while crouched down there that I noticed a little bit of rust around the inner rear wheel arch and I'm devastated beyond words. So my question is, should I fix it myself or take it to a body shop? <laughs> fix it yourself. Fix it yourself. That's what I reckon. If it's small enough, just you can fix it yourself. Cool. Thank you. Bit That's of sanding, great. I feel, bit of undercoat. Wait. I feel heaps better now. Yeah. Anytime, James. Anytime you want to talk like that, just we're here. 